Growing up in the 1990s, I watched a lot of what film historians now call empire cinema, films made between the 1930s and 60s in the heydays of colonialism that idealized or glorified life in European colonies. And I didn't realize it at the time, which doesn't say much for my critical thinking skills as a teenager, but empire films are very obviously colonial propaganda. They almost always focus on either the benevolence of colonial administrations, where the white hero saves the local people from themselves, or on the heroic sacrifice of European soldiers who embody the 19th century Eurocentric myth of the white man's burden. But there's an element to the propaganda of these films that's much more insidious that academics only really began to understand in the 1970s with the rise of post-colonial theory, and that is the colonial gaze. In a nutshell, the colonial gaze refers to the ways in which Western, predominantly male directors, often depict former European colonies, using a variety of established stereotypes that privilege Western perspectives. So, on one level, the colonial gaze is basically Orientalist. The West is typically represented as rational, masculine, and active, while the East is irrational, effeminate, and passive. The colonial gaze sees the non-Western world primarily as a backdrop for adventure, as the romantic and untamed fringes of civilization in which a Western protagonist can discover himself or be redeemed before returning to his more civilized home. And this also applies to the ways in which directors choose to film non-Western bodies, depicting women in particular, but not exclusively, as exotic sexual objects to be viewed and desired, not only by the film's male protagonists, but also by the audience, who's supposed to identify with the film's Western and ostensibly male heterosexual perspective. So in film theory, the colonial gaze refers to three different ways of looking at the non-Western world. There is the director looking through the camera and choosing how to represent the film's subjects. There are then the main characters in the film who see the non-Western world through the eyes of colonial adventurers, soldiers, or administrators. And finally, the perspective of the audience, who's encouraged to identify with the white Western protagonist and his worldview. And it's this last point, the way that audiences respond to film, that postcolonial theorists and filmmakers began to focus on in the 1970s, and has since become one of the cornerstones of postcolonial film theory. You see, Empire films weren't just made for Western audiences. They were also marketed, and sometimes even screened free of charge, to audiences living in colonial states. And over the course of decades, the popularization of pro-colonial films, literature, and art in European colonies had a profound effect on the way that many colonized peoples viewed and represented themselves. The first author to explore this in depth was the Martinican political philosopher and anti-imperial revolutionary Franz Fanon, drawing from his experiences as a psychiatrist working in Algeria at the height of the Algerian Revolution, he argued that one of the psychological effects of colonial education systems is that the colonizer becomes pathologically unable to identify with or sometimes even recognize the humanity of their colonial subjects. Over the course of generations, living in media environments saturated by this pro-colonial, essentially racist discourse, Fanon found that many of his patients, born and raised in French colonies, had begun to internalize what he called the colonial mentality. They viewed themselves in the same way as they were depicted in empire films, as inherently less civilized, less intelligent, and ultimately as racially and culturally inferior. And due to the proliferation of colonial media and education systems, many of them had never been exposed to a worldview in which racial and social equality was even remotely conceivable. Ultimately, Fanon argues that the internalized racism and self-alienation of the colonial mentality is not something that can be defeated on the battlefield or in a ballot box. Even as Algerian revolutionaries defeated the French army, they would never be free of colonial or neo-colonial influence until they began an internal psychological and cultural struggle to reject the colonial gaze and redefine their identities and history, now as equals with their own stories, their own myths, and their own heroes who defied or transcended Eurocentric stereotypes. This is part of what the Kenyan author Ngwegi Watiango calls decolonizing the mind, and it is the starting point for discussing postcolonial film theory. <laughs> 
Well, in the broadest sense imaginable, films are considered post-colonial when aspects of their production, narrative, setting, or mise-en-scene foreground either the history and legacy of colonialism or the experiences of people living under economic neocolonialism today. So post-colonial cinema is not limited to a single genre. It can include biopics, costume dramas, war films, and everything in between. But what all of these films share is that they challenge Eurocentric perspectives on the legacy of colonialism and empire. They reimagine and rewrite our old myths of imperial conquest. They critique nationalist mythologies like Manifest Destiny and directly confront Western narratives of racial and religious supremacy. In short, postcolonial films look back at the colonial gaze, and by telling non-Western stories and challenging Eurocentric stereotypes, the goal of many postcolonial filmmakers is to decolonize the stories that we tell ourselves as consumers of visual media. Postcolonial films also share a number of themes that relate to narrative and production design, so the stories that these films tell and the way that they tell those stories using art and visual aesthetics. Now, I'm not going to cover all of these. We'd be here all day, but I want to mention three prominent examples. These are perspective, identity, and language, the perspective of the protagonist, the cultural and ethnic identity of the characters, and the languages spoken in the film. To begin with, postcolonial films very often focus on indigenous non-Western perspectives that can be done through an audience surrogate, a typically Western character, an empathic traveler who might be open to different cultures and worldviews, or very often an agent of a colonizing power who's forced to empathize with the other, drawing the audience into an unfamiliar and, in the case of science fiction, sometimes literally alien world. But that can also be done directly through the eyes of a colonized protagonist, throwing the viewer into a radically different story world without an intermediary, challenging Western audiences to see through the other's eyes, and at the same time, potentially empowering audiences from that culture through narrative and cultural representation. <laughs> Indigenous perspectives are also represented in moments of direct anti-colonial action, whether that is a violent national liberation struggle, typically an asymmetrical revolution against a near-undefeatable colonial power, or the quiet revolution of self-discovery and political awakening as a protagonist comes to terms with the colonial past and attempts to build an identity that exists outside of systems of colonial and neo-colonial control. Thinking back to Franz Fanon's colonial mentality, postcolonial films also very often comment on the legacy of colonial ideology and the way that it shapes the identity of people living under colonial rule. In postcolonial filmmaking, the identities of protagonists are typically hybrid. Characters have complex, multinational, multi ethnic, or multicultural identities, and they often feel as though they're trapped between two worlds one part longing for a seat at the table, wanting to be recognized and valued within the colonial system, but struggling with the racism inherent to that system, as well as a sense of internalized inferiority. The other identity, sometimes introduced non-diegetically through dreams and magical realism, or the narrative influence of a politically conscious secondary character, often develops gradually over the course of the film and compels characters to confront the colonial order, either physically or psychologically, depending on the film's genre. Some science fiction films, like James Cameron's Avatar and Neil Blomkamp's District 9, for example, make this second post- or anti-colonial identity explicit by design, casting humanity as the colonizer and non-human aliens as the colonized. In those cases, crossing the line between colonizer and colonized leads characters to develop a hybrid identity. In the film's story world, this can be a source of personal liberation, as characters reject colonial systems of exploitation, or a source of profound physical horror as they become unrecognizable to themselves and experience neocolonial exploitation firsthand. In more historically grounded films, however, the line between colonizer and colonized sometimes blurs, and it can be difficult for the audience and the characters to fully understand how racial, cultural, and religious boundaries bleed together across the film's story world. 
This highlights the artificial nature of cultural and racial hierarchies and the complex multicultural and multi-ethnic legacy of colonialism as it still exists today. What's he say? He says he's not doing too well nowadays. People don't care for his art anymore. And finally, language is a major theme in post-colonial filmmaking. When you watch old empire films, or films made more recently, that play on nostalgia for that era in Hollywood, non-Western characters almost always speak in accented English. And they often don't speak fluently, even when they're talking to each other and not to a European protagonist. And obviously, on some level, that's a production or studio choice to make the films more marketable to Western audiences. But if you want to understand post-colonialism, you have to remember that language is an integral part of culture. And colonial authoritarian systems very often tried to eradicate indigenous languages through education. They often, for example, made it difficult, if not illegal, to speak non-European languages in schools and other public settings and forced people to use English or other European languages so that native languages would die over time with no one left to remember them. Now, those languages survived in many cases, but flash forward to the 1960s, to the height of decolonization, when that memory is still very fresh. Now think about old empire cinema. When viewed through a post-colonial lens, indigenous languages are completely absent from the cultures depicted in each film, which for a post-colonial author and filmmaker would be seen as a mirror of colonial era policies of linguistic discrimination and efforts to eradicate non-European cultural identities. So, in post-colonial film, characters typically speak the languages from the cultures that they're meant to represent. And given the history of colonial language oppression, when post-colonial filmmakers depict characters as speaking and desiring to speak non-European languages, it often takes on a political dimension that aims to decolonize the ways in which language is used and understood in visual media. Now, there are many other themes that these films share, a whole family of resemblances that we sort of point at and emphasize one or another when we describe a film as being post-colonial. Again, we're not talking so much about a genre so much as a heterogeneous collection of films that are related through choices made in their production, narrative, setting, or mise-en-scene. Now, I didn't talk very much about history. That's because the history of post-colonial filmmaking is complicated and really deserves its own dedicated discussion, but I will give a brief summary of the history of postcolonial filmmaking in the video description below. I'll also provide all the references for the video and some recommended readings, but if you're interested in a full reading list with a discussion of major authors and texts, you can come on over and visit us on Patreon, where we post reading lists, scripts, study guides, and other written content. And if you like what we're doing on the channel, you can consider supporting us to become one of these wonderful people right here, including, in particular, my Tier 1 supporter, Brandy Douglas. Hello, and thank you all very much for your support. And for you watching at home, thank you very much. Whoever you are, whatever you do, I hope you never stop learning.